little off topic this morning. Really, this isn't uh, a sermon as much as it is we need to have a conversation. And it's a little bit of a State of the Union uh, address after the last 60 days, the first 60 days of Pillar. Uh, You have to remember, part of my job, a major part of my job here is leading the church. And part of leading is making sure that I do whatever I need to do to, to help you stay ahead of what is ahead. Are you tracking with me? That, that's good leadership. If, if I know it, but I don't help you understand it, then you will be unprepared to steward it, correct? Okay. So there's some things we need to talk about because I know some of us just look and we're really excited about everything going on and, all, and it's all great. Uh, and it may not seem like much has changed from Gateway Scottsdale to Pillar, but here's what I would tell you sitting in this seat. Everything has changed. Everything, literally everything, behind the scenes, spiritually speaking, it appears as though everything has changed. With the elders, it's changed, and I mean for good, but I I need to help you understand what has changed, all right? Now, uh, if you've got a Bible, you can open up to Acts chapter 6, we'll we'll get to that at the end, and if you really, if you want two spots, you can put a marker in Acts 6, and we're going to read a couple verses in Isaiah uh, 54, 53, 52, in that area. Part of what I need you to do with this weekend, I need you to extend me a little bit of grace this weekend. So I'm not doing friend of God. I didn't, I didn't know why until uh, last night. You've probably heard me speak for a couple of years about what we call House of Bethany. How many of you have heard me talk about that before? Okay, House of Bethany is a project that God gave us a burden for years and years and years ago. Not just Holly and me, but our church, our elders. This is a burden, and I believe an anointing God has set aside for our church. House of Bethany is meant to be a safe place for single moms to be able to live, grow, raise their kids for a season, and prepare for the next season of life before we send them out fully ready to go. A place where we can disciple them, a place where we can protect them, a place where we can help them with their children. And so, you've heard me talk about this, and and one of the things I gotta remind you of as far as the way I lead, because sometimes I take a few hits for this. When I feel God say something, most of the time I feel it's important to share it with you even if it doesn't happen for a half a decade. And we've actually had people leave our church before because I've talked about House of Bethany, and then to them, they saw nothing happen for a couple of years. And, and to them, it appeared as though it was immature leadership, me just trying to hype up and share vision. That's not my style at all. If anything, I'm the exact opposite because I used to be the hype guy and get everybody all riled up. And then I learned you have to back it up. And so now I just try and keep my mouth shut most of the time. But if I feel God say something, Preston, this is coming, you you need to know, I'm gonna share it with you. Even if it makes me look stupid because it doesn't happen for a long time, you have to understand, I have resolved the fact, most of the time you're gonna think I'm an idiot. And I'm okay with that. It's okay if you think I'm crazy every once in a while. If you don't, I'm not leading well. If you can understand everything I do, it means I am leading in an extremely predictable and controlling fashion. But if you can't understand everything I do, then you do understand that I'm following the one who knows everything, but I don't. Okay, so I've talked about House of Bethany. Uh, The awesome thing about you all, we haven't even done anything with House of Bethany yet. We've just been waiting. I don't know if you know this, we live in an expensive city. So trying to find a deal is a complicated process. All right? Well, you may not know this about you all, but we haven't even done anything yet with House of Bethany. I've just shared the vision every once in a while, and more than $150,000 is sitting in an account when we're ready to buy a House of Bethany, just because you all are crazy people. Well, last night, the elders put an offer on a House of Bethany, and we don't know yet. Uh, We thought... We were going to get this thing done last night, and we'll know tomorrow at noon. 
But I, let me just take a couple of minutes to bring you in. Remember, this really isn't a sermon as much as it is we need to talk. And I'll, I need to do this every once in a while, okay? And there's going to be some stuff. We'll, we'll cover scripture, okay, for those of you who are like, oh, I get to the Bible, okay? <laughs> what I'm actually talking about is us living out the Bible, okay? Uh, so the elders, we've been looking for years, uh, I, I would say, semi-actively. In the last meeting, it was the last agenda item, us just talking about House of Bethany, make sure we're all praying about House of Bethany, and that was just two weeks ago. Uh, if you know anything about multifamily units, over the last couple of years, uh, real estate hasn't just skyrocketed in our town, multifamily went through the roof. And so if you know the multifamily space, in Scottsdale, if you want to have a multifamily complex, let's say of four units for single moms, you're looking at about $400,000 per unit and they're Cracker Jack boxes. If you wanna get a deal, you have to go into a scarier part of town, which is what we're trying to get many of these women out of. But even there, it's about a quarter of a million dollars per unit. Okay, well, we found a place two minutes from here. How many of you would have thought, when I've talked about House of Bethany, that it would be anywhere close to 40 minutes from here because of the price? I, didn't, I thought we'd all have to drive nearly an hour to get to a deal. Two minutes from here. 11 bedrooms. It was a 1,900 square foot house that somebody added on, then added on, then added on, then built another house across the back. And it's a U around the pool with a tennis court and a half court basketball court for the kids in the backyard. Plenty of room for gardens, possibly chickens for those of us who enjoy. <laughs> Chickens. Hey, ladies need those fresh eggs. You see how expensive eggs are right now? The church is going to have some chickens. I'll say this. It's the weirdest house in Scottsdale. So weird that it seems like it might be perfect for what we need. It's about 50 years old, but I want you to imagine something. Imagine your life group, and if you're not in a group, you should get in one. But imagine your group saying, we're going to adopt a bedroom. We're going to repaint it. We're going to furnish it. We're going to put bunk beds in it. Can you imagine, ladies, after your gathering, going through a class saying, six of us are going to go over and work at the House of Bethany. Men, after a fight club, imagine saying, we're going to go over and do some landscaping at the property. It's incredibly safe. It's got a gate. The ladies will be absolutely safe. Three huge bedrooms could have a king bed and bunks for a mom and her kids. But then four are almost like two-bedroom suites where mom can have a room and the kids can have a room. That's what I'm talking about. You can have a room too. It just seems like it's, it could be the one. Now, I don't want you to get emotionally excited about it. It's okay to get excited. But here's what I need you to know. All right, this is kind of like a puppy where when we talk to the kids about a puppy, everybody's like, oh, we got a puppy. This is going to be amazing. And then four months into having the dog, no one picks up the poop in the backyard. You know what I'm talking about? So what I need you to hear as I talk about House of Bethany is not the awesome opportunity. It's the awesome responsibility. And that's one of the big changes between Gateway and Pillar. The title of this little conversation is When God Moves. And on the Leaders Cut over the next two weeks, I'm actually going to be talking about uh, are you prepared for a hot streak? Because I believe God wants to do some new things through you in this season. I don't know if you've noticed, but some new stuff is going on around the earth today. And I want God to use you to be a part of it. So on the Leaders Cut, I'm going to talk about are you ready for a spiritual hot streak? And can you steward it? Once it starts, can you keep it going? But today, what we're going to talk about is when God moves, a couple of things need to happen. Here's the first thing. When God moves, you have to make room at his request. You have to make room at his request. Isaiah 54, verses 2 and 3 speak to this quite well. Enlarge your house. Build an addition. Spread out your home and spare no expense, for you will soon be bursting at the seams. 
Okay, some of you think I'm going to be talking about a building. I am not. We have enough room on this campus to get to 3,000 people, in my opinion. Now, will it be a little bit of a nightmare with parking and things? If you want to use the word nightmare, I think God would use the word dream come true. Part of what I want to do is recalibrate your brain to what's about to go down this next couple of years, because I think some crazy stuff's about to go down. And I don't want, want anybody chunking the deuces. So let me ask you a question. Would it be okay if many people who do not know Jesus come to know Jesus over the next couple of years through our church? Is that okay with you? Okay. Okay, here's what I want to talk to you about then. There are three types of people I want you to make more room for in your heart. We can make more room as a church, but if you don't make more room in your heart, it, this is not going to work. So I'm talking to you, not to the organization. I'm talking to you about you. The first type of person we all need to make more room for in our hearts, the blind, the spiritually blind, those who do not yet know Jesus. Acts 2.47, this was the way, the move of God in the first century, movement of God, this is how it went down. Acts 2.47, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I'm all about church growth. But I'm far more about kingdom growth. Kingdom growth. Here's why. When this is how the church grows, people being saved, this is also how hell shrinks. Hell doesn't shrink when a church just gets bigger by sheep swapping. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking shots at anybody. I'm just saying, listen, would it be okay if more people came to Jesus over the next couple of years than over the first 10 years of our church. Okay, how many of us would love to see that? Please put your hand up high. Okay, I'm gonna remind you, you put your hand up. Because one day you're gonna be tempted to email me. Preston, I got people all around me in my row. Dirty, she was wearing this, he was talking like that. I cannot believe I go to a church where this is okay. Here's going to be my email response. Did you raise your hand that day? Don't tell me you want a puppy. And then when she starts making a mess in the house, you want to get rid of her. Preston, are you saying things might get a little bit messier for us as a church if we do it right? Do you realize what God has assembled over the last 10 years? All, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, all the last 10 years for Gateway Scottsdale was, was a 10-year opportunity to build one of the best church planting teams in the state of Arizona. He assembled an army of savages. We're not just here so that we can get more people like us. We are here as an army to get the people Jesus died for. Listen. Okay, I appreciate all of the applause, but I'm going to remind you, you clapped when you sent me that email. <laughs> There's a verse that I love that just, it's a beautiful picture. Isaiah 52, if you're in 54, you can read it for yourself. Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. If you know anything about me, you know I don't like feet. I don't. It took me literally 15 years to just become copacetic, okay with my wife's feet. All right? I don't know why. It's just a feet thing, okay? How beautiful are their feet? I've always read that verse and be like, there's no such thing. Some of you are like, I have beautiful feet. You're the only one who says that. But I want you to think, practically about this verse how beautiful are the feet that climb the mountain here's my paraphrase bring the good news to someone who's never heard it in a really remote and difficult place to get to i want you to imagine in biblical times what those feet would have looked like would they have looked pedicured or would they have looked very dirty here's what scripture teaches us beautiful feet 
our dusty feet. This next season of our church, you might see a little bit more dust than you saw the first 10 years. Again, only if we do it right. If we don't do it right, this place is going to stay pristinely clean. And some of you, you like that. And hear my heart. I'm, <laughs> listen, I'm not going to create messes. So don't start reading into what I'm saying. Because some of you are like, oh, I love this church. It, it seems healthy. And, and Yes, yes. But I don't just want to be a healthy place. The healthier a church is, the more unhealthy people need to be attracted to it. Right? Okay. First type of person we, we all need to make more room for, the spiritually blind. Those who do not yet know Jesus. We could all use to have a little more dirt on our feet. Here's the second type of person we need to make more room for, the brokenhearted. The brokenhearted. This, for me, is the de-churched. So the first, the spiritually blind, are the unchurched. But then, in our day, we need to do something about the de-churched. Now, there's two types of de-churched people. And, and so that you know, a de-churched person is someone who was in the church that left the church. But there's two types of de-churched people. First, there's the type of de-churched person that left the church, but not their faith. But the other de-churched person is the person who left the church as well as their faith. There's a lot of that. I believe that one of the calls on our church is to reach the de-churched. I believe we have an anointing to do it. They've been burned by the church in the past, and so they bounced. Would it be okay with you if in this next run as a church, we had a lot of people who've been saying for the last couple of years they hate the church, come back to church and see God in a way they've never seen him before? Would that be okay with you? Would you put your hand up? Okay, I'm gonna remind you, you raise your hand. When you send me an email, press on what's going on with our church. During meet and greet, I started talking to somebody and they were just bashing our church and this was only their third week. What is going on? Yeah, I'm going to remind you. They're just hurting. They don't even know enough about our church. They're just hurting. And the question I'm going to ask you is, do you want them to get healthy again? And are you okay if this is a place where that happens? Hey, you know what that means. If we're going to be a healthy place for less healthy people to come, and see God in a new way, it means every once in a while someone's going to sneeze on you during meet and greet. But don't worry, you're not going to get sick. It's not a sickness. It's just an attack of the enemy. They're just being attacked. Okay, all of us, we need to make more room in our hearts for the de-churched, whether they've given up on their faith or not. Then here's the third, the builders. The spiritually blind, the brokenhearted, and the builders. What's a builder? A disciple who makes disciples. And here's where I want to talk to you if you've been walking to Jesus for a while. If you've been walking with Jesus, if you haven't already, you need to start preparing to disciple disciples. You cannot just be a good disciple by being a good learner. At some point, the apprentice needs to become a teacher. This is how the body grows. I believe so much in the call of God in your life that I don't want you to stay where you are. And as the senior pastor of Pillar Church, you have to know I'm going to challenge you far more than I did as the senior pastor of Gateway Scottsdale. And here's why. Not because I don't think you're doing a great job, but because I believe in your call even more than you do. And it's why God has you here. And some of you, are really great learners, but you've bought a lie that you could never be a good teacher. The best learners oftentimes make the best teachers. And there is a message God put inside of you, and part of my job is to help you find the place where you were to share that for the good of the kingdom of God. You can't stay where you are. You need to make more room in your heart for you to become a disciple who disciples disciples. And we'll be fine as a church if you do. 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, Paul says to Timothy, brilliant words, you've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. 
Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. This is how it works. We just keep passing it on. Good teaching. We get under good teaching. We got a lot of great teachers here. And over this next couple of years, you're going to start seeing a lot more of their teaching. We have a limited amount of time in the weekend. But as we start to put stuff online and in an app for you to be discipled whenever you want. Listen, if you love to binge Netflix, you need to use that superpower for the good of the kingdom of God. How many of you ever thought you would hear a pastor say, binging Netflix is a superpower? It can be if you just use that same strength to binge godly teaching. Remember, that's part of how the first century church exploded. They devoted themselves to the teaching, right? Okay, so you've been practicing with Netflix for years. Now as we start putting more teaching out there, just use that strength to binge on the living word of God. You can do both. I ain't mad at you. I'm not, I don't have a problem with you watching six episodes in a row of something. You needed to relax a little bit. Now, you do that seven days a week, we got a problem. It's time for you to become a disciple who disciples disciples. Here's the second thing. When God moves, we have to make room for change as a result. I know for some of us, this is a curse word. Here's why we have to make room for change. When God does something new, it always requires something new. Like if I just said, how many of us want to see God do something new? It, no, no one wants to put their hand up now because they're like, these are all tricks, Preston. <laughs> hey, no, seriously, how many of us want to see God do something new? Okay, you're hesitant because you know what I'm about to say. That's going to require all of us to do something new. I want God to do something new. I think he's sitting on the throne of the universe going, mm -hmm, I know how that feels. I want you all to do something new. Let's do it together. But when God does something new, it requires something new of us, something new of you. When we talk about change, I wanna, I wanna give you two arenas of change. First, let's talk about organizational change as a church. Here's the, probably the most simple way I could describe the anointing on Gateway Scottsdale compared to the anointing on Pillar as it appears the first 60 days of our new church. The anointing on Gateway Scottsdale was to plow and to prepare. The anointing on Pillar is to be aggressive and apostolic. The Lord's helping me understand this because I don't always think like this. Many of you who've been here at church for a while have gotten used to essentially my spiritual posture being this right here. And I'm not going to lie. I know some of you love it because you think this is the antithesis of ambition. And so you look at me and you go, oh man, this is, this is fantastic. Preston's a humble leader. And what you're really doing is saying, it doesn't seem like Preston does very much. And I like that he's just content to wait on the Lord. You have to understand, while this looked like my posture for 10 years, actually what I was doing was just obeying. I was just obeying because he kept saying, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Can you imagine for 10 straight years hearing those words, not yet, not yet, until last summer, the Lord saying, now. Okay, when he changes up the language like that, my posture has to change too. And some of you might look in my direction over the next couple of years because you're gonna see me do things I haven't done over the last 10 years. You might be tempted to look at my direction and go, Preston's not the same guy. I just, I just, I wish for the old Preston. I don't even know if this is the church for us anymore because Preston isn't the way Preston used to be. Okay, let me ask you a question. If you're a parent, is that how you talked about your children when they went through puberty? Did you literally, when your kids were going through a major life transition, stepping into the next season of what God had for them, did you look them in the eye and say, I just don't love you as much because you're not two anymore. You were so great when I could just kiss on you and rock you to sleep, but now you're 15. I can't hold you anymore. You stink. <laughs> Did anyone talk to their teenager like that? Don't answer that out loud. <laughs> right? 
No. Change is a part of growing up. You're going to see me go through some changes over this next couple of years. Please. And you can ask me anytime. I intentionally put myself in the lobby. If you have a question, you can come, come to me. But don't just assume you know. And please don't assume anything you see me do is ambition. I tried to be as obedient as I could for a decade, sitting. But listen, I wasn't doing nothing, and neither were we. We were sitting the whole time this first decade, loading up spiritual bullets for the fight we knew was coming. And while too many of my friends on the outside, they wondered, is he even doing anything? I was completely content to lead you in a cave, stockpiling kingdom weaponry for a fight that is now going down. And because the season has changed, you're going to see me go from sitting like that to going out to the front line of battle. It's what I was made for. I don't want to be famous. I don't care to be known. But that might happen at some point. But I need you to know, it's not about that. I just want to plunder hell. And I just want to take my place. Whatever God asks of me, I just want to do it. But I need to feel safe that you understand. I'm just doing my best to do what God asked me to do. It wasn't for the first 10 years I was walking by the Spirit, and now I'm going to walk by the flesh. I must live by the Spirit three times more than I ever have in my life, and I can feel it. But there are going to be some changes. It's going to look a little bit different. Here's the other type of change, personal changes. This is where I want to talk about you. When the Spirit of God moves, it's always uncomfortable for the flesh of man. I know, when I say, how many of us want to see a move of God? Woo! And then I say, your flesh is going to have to die more than ever to steward a move of God. Wah, wah. It's the price of admission. Carrying the cross. Because that's what the one we follow. That's what he did. You know, some people, they look at our church and, and they've been here for a while and they say, I love this church because it's where I do what I do. There's a place for me to do what I do. Okay, I don't ever want that to be something that's celebrated. You know what I want to be celebrated? That our church is a place where God does what he does and we do what he asks. Very different than this is where I just do what I do. What you did in the last season might not be what God asked you to do in this next season. And if your identity was wrapped up in what you did in the last season, you might get really frustrated in the middle of a move of God. What do you want? Deep down, what do you want? Do you want to do whatever you want? Or do you want to see God do what only God can do? I want to see God do what only he can do. The only way that's going to happen is if we do what he asks us to do. That's going to require some of us to change a little bit. A church where you get whatever you want is an unhealthy church. A church where you don't get everything you want is a healthy church. A church where God gets what he wants is an anointed church. But a church where God always gets what he wants is an unstoppable church. I want to be an unstoppable church. Okay, then every time God tells you to do something, do it. Preston, why are we doing a capital campaign to move into a building? Blah, blah, church is all about buildings, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to remind you when you send me that email. You told me you wanted to be an unstoppable church. Don't get mad at me when God asks you to sow something that scares the living daylights out of you. Are you hearing what I'm trying to say? This is part of my job. I have to prepare you for what's coming. And this is not some rah-rah. Please hear me. I'm not trying to say, God is doing something big in our church. Get all your friends in as fast as possible. This is not that message. This is not about getting them in here. It's about getting you ready for out there. Big difference. 
in 60 days, it's obvious everything has changed. Part of my job, if God has called you to make this your church home, part of my job is to make sure you know how to be prepared for whatever God wants to do next. Here's the third thing. So make space, make room for change, make up your mind. In a move of God, we all have to make up our mind. When God moves, man has a decision to make. Will I? Will I? When God moves, it's meant to create movement among God's people. Whenever the pillar moved, what would the people of Israel do? When I move, you move. Just like that. My people. When I move, you move. A move of God was always meant to create movement among God's people. This might be a strong statement for you, but a move of God that does not create movement among God's people was just a flash in the pan. It was a, a sliver of what I believe God wanted it to be. But when man responds, when God moves, anything can happen. What does scripture say about a double-minded man in the book of James? A double-minded man is unstable in what? All of his ways. How many woke up this morning and said, you know what my goal for today is? To be unstable in all my ways. <laughs> Anybody set that goal this morning? Right? Nobody did. And yet, when God begins to move, we kind of see this. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, man, this is so expensive. Oh, this is awesome. Oh, man, this is so extravagantly, excruciatingly expensive. Oh, this is incredible. Oh, no. It's back and forth. I love it. I hate it. I love it happening, I hate what it costs. I love it happening, I hate what it costs. I love it happening, I hate what it costs. Okay, scripture says, if I'm double-minded in any area, I'm unstable in all my areas. We have to make up our mind. Listen, a couple of you might be thinking, I don't know if this is the church for me. Totally okay. I'm not trying to run you off, please hear me. I'm definitely not trying to run anybody off, but I would ask you a question. So you're telling me you're considering leaving a church because God says he wants to be more present there? I'm just making sure you understand what you're saying. This book is the most expensive book in human history. And if it doesn't hurt to live out, it isn't being lived out. And please forgive me if I, as a middle-aged man, get more and more comfortable sharing the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Please forgive me, but I won't apologize. Because the one I'm obsessed with said, you want to be like me? You got to die. You got to die, Preston. This is how it works. This is how my father's business explodes, not just expands. When those who run with me live like me and I die. I don't want to play church, and it's not that we have been. I'm so grateful for what we've done. But listen, we are sitting on an inheritance that is immeasurable. I'm not just talking about our church. I'm talking about the church. This is the most important entity on the earth. I don't want to just sit on it. I want to leverage it. Our city needs it. Single moms need it. Man, have I had time to tell you the stories that Holly and I have had to navigate over the years. Women going through our discipleship process for a couple months and then not having any other option but to go back into their former situation with a deadbeat boyfriend who broke into her house in the middle of the night, busted through the window, went into her bedroom, grabbed her by the hair, drug her back through the front of the house. He got arrested, but I'm not okay with that. God has blessed our church. I don't want to just enjoy it. I want to leverage what God is doing among us. There are people who need this. And we must make room for it. God is moving among us. That was my dream. I told Robert that when he sent me out here. 
He said, Preston, the Lord said, it's time to get you ready to go. And I said, well, make me one promise. Do not send me out to plant a church. I have learned anyone can do that. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I said, promise me you will only send me out if you think there's a decent chance that God might be able to trust me to steward a move of God. Because I'm a part of one here. I don't want to leave. If you don't think I can extend the family business, which is a move of God, then don't send me. They didn't just teach me how to build a healthy and strong church. Robert has spent two decades behind closed doors helping me understand by letting me just watch him how to steward something only God could take credit for. I'm not trying to be huge, but I am trying to be strong. Because I don't know if you know this, the people we love are being picked on in unprecedented fashion. And they need a safe place where they can come into the unbridled presence of God. No matter how much they're throwing up. No matter what they did last night. And I want that to be here. And I'm going to personalize this. But you're going to need to make up your mind. We can't go into this next season double-minded. Acts chapter 6, I want to show you. This is one of my favorite chapters. This is actually how we named the Young Adults Ministry back in Dallas many years ago when I took that and started it. Acts chapter 6. This move of God is spreading like a wildfire. Acts 6 verse 1. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were grumblings of discontent. Church people, bro. They're in the middle of a move of God and people are ticked off. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. It wasn't that the food program was no longer important. It's that there was a season where the oil of heaven was on the apostles to run the food program, but that season had come to an end. This is what the apostles are saying. It's no longer good for us to do what we did in the prior season. Watch what they do. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we, we apostles, can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Watch verse five. Everyone liked this idea. Everyone liked this idea. So they chose the seven. And look at verse seven. So God's message, watch the... Watch God's response to seven people taking their place, and that domino helped the apostles take their place, and that domino helped others take their place. Watch God's response to everybody taking their place. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased. Here's what I need you to know. When the people of God don't take their place in the house of God, it always creates problems for the family of God. It always creates problems for the kingdom of God. We're an army. I gotta like our chances in this fight. I genuinely do. I don't care what anybody thinks in this. I like our chances. We're like Scrappy-Doo. We might not be the sexiest fighter in the ring on paper, but you turn those lights out and you sick us on that enemy, Scrappy-Doo going to take him out. I, I believe. In part because God brought you here. That we are strong enough for what is coming, what is happening right now. But this part of the conversation isn't about your strength. It's about your service. An essential part of the first move of God after the resurrection of Jesus was believers taking their place.
Again, how many of us raised our hand and said, I want to see a move of God in a way I never have before? All of us. Here's my response. Okay. If you want him to do what he does, you have to do more of what he created you to do. Do you realize that it's quite possible that in our children's generation or grandchildren's generation, there's a chance Jesus could return before the end of my grandchildren's lifetime? Question. If part of our responsibility as a church is apostolic, that we are to raise up the next generation, to steward a move of God, then why would it ever be hard to serve in children's ministry? Because it's not babysitting. It's preparing them to steward a move of God. I'm not saying we have a problem. What I'm saying is we should have an overabundance of oaks in our church who are raising up the next generation with their hands in the mud. Especially the oak who said, you know, there's one place I'll never serve in the church. Children's. You want to make God giggle? Start doing things you've said you would never do. It's a major part of seeing a move of God. Start doing things you never said you would do. Raising someone else's four-year-old. On my list of things I thought I would never do. But when confronted by the God of the universe with that sweet tone, Preston, would you please do this for me? Lord, this might last more than a couple years. Mm -hmm. Preston, want to know in part what death looks like for you? You want to be like me? Then do this for me. <laughs> Everybody rah rahs when we talk about a move of God, but when we sit down to count the cost, I just don't want there to be crickets. I believe it's happening. And right now, it's just, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Some of you think I'm crazy. I'm not trying to rah-rah you. I'm trying to prepare you. God is moving among us, and he's moving around the earth. And he, his eyes are wandering to and fro to see who can I trust to move through in unprecedented ways in this day and time on the earth. When God moves, we must move.